The last time I looked at a Mario game, it was Super Mario 64. With it being one of the first video games I ever got to play, I had a lot to say about it. It's one of my favorite video games of all time, and the amount of memories that Mario 64 gave me is something I'll always cherish. Super Mario Sunshine and I do not have that kind of connection. In fact, it couldn't be more of the opposite if it tried. I have no nostalgic attachment to Sunshine whatsoever. Back then, I never had a GameCube. My parents got me the original Xbox instead. I did have one cousin who had the GameCube, but they didn't live nearby and they also didn't really have the big GameCube titles like Mario Sunshine or even Melee. They did have Kirby Air Ride though, that shit rocked. With that said, I was definitely aware of Sunshine's existence, I just had no way of playing it. I was a little busy with my Xbox playing Tac 2 to Staff of Dreams, Ultimate Spider-Man, Jedi Academy, along with trying to find an Xbox copy of Sonic Heroes. Once I started using the internet more often, I did eventually look up videos about Sunshine, like Let's Plays and stuff, though initially, I was actually a bit more fascinated by Luigi's Mansion, and I would look up more videos about that game instead. Luigi was always my favorite, so seeing him have his own game on a console that I never got to own was such a treat for me as a kid. This review ain't about Luigi, though. Sometime later, Sunshine did eventually start piquing my interest. The first time I got to play the game was around 2012 to 2013, when I attempted to emulate the game using the Dolphin emulator. Everyone loves Dolphin. It played fine enough, but my PC at the time wasn't really built for gaming. I think the furthest I got was Serena Beach, but I got stuck because the emulator wouldn't recognize the analog triggers on my PS3 controller. Yeah, I was using the DualShock 3. It's all 14 year old me had, which also meant I was kind of limited on how I could use Flood. This was 12 years ago though. Dolphin is definitely way better at emulating this nowadays. While I wouldn't get an actual GameCube until 2019, I did end up getting a Nintendo Wii for my birthday in 2008. Yep, a follow-up to the birthday party story from the Mario 64 review, if you guys remember, and I eventually learned that the Wii was backwards compatible with GameCube games. By the time I was a teenager, I eventually tracked down and got my own copies of several GameCube games, and finally got to experience Mario Sunshine, and all these other Nintendo games I missed out on as a kid. So I've had a physical copy of Mario Sunshine for about 10 years now, and I've been playing the game here ever since, you know, for the few times I've gone back to play it for the past decade. I think by the time I got my copy, a lot of content creators I watched during the early 2010s like Brain Scratch commentaries, and especially some call me Johnny, had made their own videos about Mario Sunshine, which was where I first learned about other people's experiences with this game, and it's many issues. A sequel to Super Mario 64 was the obvious way to go after the game's success as a N64 launch title. While the console did get plenty of spin-off Mario titles, a second mainline game was never really made, and as the years went on, it became pretty clear to Nintendo that they should just wait to release a new Mario game on their next big game console. But the sequel to Mario 64, which was codenamed Super Mario 128, clever, was initially being made for the Nintendo 64 disk drive add-on, which wouldn't come to fruition because the 64DD was such a huge flop in Japan that it didn't even make it overseas. So while Mario 128 was quickly cancelled behind the scenes, Nintendo would work on their next big game console for release in the upcoming millennium. On May 12, 1999, my first birthday, yay, Nintendo announced their successor to the N64, codenamed the Dolphin at the time. Yes, newbies, that's where the emulator you love using so much got its name from. Obviously, the console would get finalized as the GameCube, with it making its first major public appearance at Nintendo Space World 2000. A lot of tech demos were shown off at that year's Space World, and one of these tech demos would be known as Super Mario 128. It was a simple demonstration that showed off about 128 Marios running around on these shifting surfaces. It's one of the most fascinating tech demos in Nintendo's history, and there were actually some pretty dumb people out there who thought that this was somehow a new Mario game and not just what it was? A simple tech demo? What the hell would a premise of 128 Marios have even entailed? That's a gimmick you do for one level, not the whole game. Though the idea of controlling several characters on screen at once would be carried over the Pikmin, and the weird shifting platforms idea would pretty much be used for Mario Galaxy. The actual Super Mario GameCube game was going to be revealed soon, which would happen at next year's Space World in 2001, which would end up being the last Space World consumer event that Nintendo held. At the event, the new 
Mario game was revealed as Super Mario Sunshine, which also included an early trailer for the game. Nintendo Space World 2001 took place between August 24th to the 26th, which would end up being a full year before the game's release in the US. The only Space World footage we have of the game is about a minute long and in pretty low quality. There's also plenty of screenshots too from gaming journalists at the time like IGN and GamerWeb. The Space World build of Sunshine is one of the most fascinating early betas for a Mario game, like the life hut is in the shape of a sun, which I actually think is pretty cute. It also featured early versions of Delfino Plaza, the game's main hub area, and the first level, Bianco Hills. The level layouts were obviously different and featured very little people in the actual areas. That's not to say there just aren't any NPCs. Some of the citizens of Isle Delfino are present in this build, like the Piantas and this random human girl? Who the fuck is this and why isn't she in the game? Bianco Hills also featured this huge guy walking about. This version of the game also appears to be running at 60 frames a second. This will be important to note for later. But the main thing this early trailer first showed off was that Mario was not traveling on his own. He was also equipped with a weird water nozzle thing on his back. So it's not just regular 3D Mario gameplay anymore. What's that about? It should also be noted that Super Mario Sunshine was the first mainline Mario game to not feature Shigeru Miyamoto or Takashi Tezuka as the lead directors, though both of them would serve as the game's producers. Sunshine was directed by Yoshiaki Koizumi and Kanta Yuji, both in their first time leading a Mario game, with Koizumi himself having history working on previous Mario projects like Super Mario Kart and Yoshi's Island, along with being an assistant director for Mario 64, and he would also go on to lead and produce several other future Mario games. However, one other figure for both Sunshine and Nintendo at the time would be attached to this game, and he's someone that I somehow haven't brought up yet, the late Satoru Iwata, a figure in the gaming industry who initially joined HAL Laboratory in 1980, where he would go on to help create iconic video game characters and franchises like Kirby, and even Mother aka Earthbound. Some of my personal favorite stories with Iwata was how he helped Game Freak with several issues they encountered while making the Generation 2 Pokemon games, Gold and Silver. You remember how the entirety of the Kanto region from Gen 1 was fully accessible in the postgame of Gen 2? Well, that was partially because of Iwata and his incredible coding knowledge. Another really cool thing Iwata did happened during the hell that was the Smash Bros. Melee development cycle. With that game only having 13 months to be finished, Sakurai and company were crunching it hard, just so they can get the game released in time as a launch title for the GameCube. And they almost didn't make it until Iwata stepped in and helped them finish the game. While Melee didn't get launched on the same day, it did did release just one month after the GameCube, and would become both the best-selling game on the GameCube and the Smash Brothers game to steal my heart. No joke, I love Melee, and that love comes entirely from never growing up playing it. It's so wonderful. So if you couldn't tell, Iwata was pretty fucking cool, and someone at Nintendo definitely noticed his efforts because by May 2002, he'd become the CEO of the company and would remain there until his tragic passing in 2015. While I don't think he had a hand directly in the development of Mario Sunshine, this would end up becoming the first Mario game release where Iwata was acting Nintendo president, and would even serve as the game's executive producer. This man was the heart and soul of Nintendo, and I miss his energy and passion in the company constantly. Like, they really lost something major when he died. Sure, he would oversee the success of the Wii and the unfortunate decline of the Wii U before passing, but nobody's perfect. Even the late Gunpei Yokoi saw the rise of the Game Boy and the huge failure of the Virtual Boy just before he died. Oh uh, well, this is depressing. Let's get back to the GameCube. The console was released in late 2001 with no Mario game at launch, but we did have Luigi's Mansion, shortly got Melee, oh, and there was Pikmin. Can't forget about Pikmin. We know Miyamoto didn't. While I never grew up with a GameCube and didn't actually own one until like 18 years later, it's probably my favorite Nintendo console of all time. Maybe even game console. I like how unique it is. The actual game discs are small and definitely angered a lot of dorks for their lack of space but I just think this was cute. The GameCube has so much personality to it and was home to so much experimentation and had such a varied library of games, especially first party. But as much as I and many others love this console nowadays, it was a pretty huge flop for Nintendo. Iwata would say that the console was expected to ship 50 million units by March 2005, eh, optimistic thinking, but in reality, the GameCube became Nintendo's worst selling console at the time, only being able to ship over 20 million units by the end of 2006. It's sad because the GameCube clearly has a huge cult following, with people continuing to this day to sing the praises of the console's innovations and whatnot. Again, I bought one of these motherfuckers in 2019, and I still play it more than my goddamn 
Switch, and I've had both for approximately the same time. Obviously, the failure of the GameCube would lead to the Nintendo Wii, which appealed more to the general market, which really pissed off plenty of Nintendo fans who loved the GameCube. The Wii was clearly far more successful, and it's obviously a topic for a different video, but I did want to point something out. The original Wii did launch with GameCube hardware built into it, since the two were pretty similar technical-wise, which in turn gave us probably the best backwards compatibility out of any console at the time. So, in a way, the Wii sort of gave the GameCube a second chance to not just sell more and end up in more people's homes, but it also gave people who maybe missed out on the console the first time another chance to check out its library. It's what happened to me. The GameCube itself didn't stop production until 2007, and the Wii kept having backwards compatibility until the remodel in 2011. So while several Nintendo fans may hate the Wii, in a way, it sort of indirectly helped the GameCube live on. I'm sure that probably wasn't one of the biggest intentions with the Wii, but I like thinking it was designed that way on purpose. So thank you for that, Iwata, you beautiful man. Wait, this video is supposed to be about Mario Sunshine. Fuck! So around the same time Iwata was made Nintendo president, E3 2002 was happening. At Nintendo's conference, more of Mario Sunshine was shown off. The game was drastically different from the 2001 Space World build, appearing much closer to the final game. The only major differences I can notice is how the game still has an unfinalized HUD, and it also still ran at 60 frames a second. The reason I keep bringing this up is because the final game runs at 30, which isn't a huge deal, but it is fascinating seeing the game still run at a higher frame rate so late in development. That that being said, at points it was suffering from some pretty bad slowdown, so I'm guessing the decision to run the game at 30 frames was probably added at the last minute, likely due to time constraints because, unfortunately, they were rushing the game. Also, in the video we have from the show floor footage, we can faintly hear Charles Martinet as Mario saying, Welcome to e there you go. <laughs> And that's adorable. Super Mario Sunshine was first released in Japan on July 18th, 2002, and would later release in the US in August, and PAL regions would receive it in October. While I never personally got to play Sunshine as a kid, back then I did have some interest in it. The water nozzle gimmick really fascinated me, and I also really liked the art style and music. Also, the box art looks sick, but I really can't take this render of Mario seriously anymore because... Does anyone remember Super Gangsta Mario from back in the day? This was such a common image to see back in the MySpace days. I am aware of the goofy live-action commercial that was made for Sunshine, but I don't have any memory or recollection of catching it on TV. Mainly because I was just four when this game came out. The first time I heard of it was when Brain Scratch commentaries kept referencing it. And watching it now, it's incredibly cheesy, but I really like it. The world of special place. Cherish life and never waste. Everyone loves the sunshiny day. We're gonna keep it that way. Let's clean is better than dirty. And dirty's meaner than clean. Let's all lend a helping hand. Mario can't do it alone. I wish we had this in better quality. Not a shitty AI muddied up one. I really love the production values in these old commercials a lot. If I recall, I think the company that made the costumes were the same people who did a lot of these old Nintendo commercials, including the famous Smash Brothers one. Now, I was a baby when the first Smash Brothers game came out. Here's photographic evidence again. So while I have zero memories of seeing this on TV, I do remember way back when when my cousins and I were browsing online and we found it and we thought it was the fun Funniest shit ever. It still is. Something's gone wrong in the happy go lucky world of Nintendo. Well, I think I've wasted enough of your time with all that backstory, so let's dive right into Super Mario Sunshine. Starting with the story, Sunshine is probably the most unique in comparison to the other 3D Mario games, mainly in terms of how it presents the plot. This game has a decent handful of cutscenes with full-blown voice acting, including an opening cutscene setting up the premise. One quick thing to notice that the opening cutscene is in 4x3, but the rest of the cutscenes are 16x9 letterboxed. Not too sure why, but whatever, I might just crop these to fit the full frame because why not? Mario, Peach, and new character Toadsworth are off on vacation to a resort island known as Isle Delfino, home to the Piantas, and the island is in the shape of a dolphin. Ain't that cute? But upon arriving to the island, their airstrip is covered in this icky paint like goop. It's 
moving! I will address the voice acting later. So as Mario is investigating, he comes across a device just lying on the floor named Flood, an invention that lets Mario spray water on the goop to clean it up. Also, yes, when Flood first reads Mario, you can see a list of the previous Mario games in the bottom right. That's neat. However, after Mario cleans the first bit of goop in the game, he's immediately arrested and put on trial. Apparently, a shadowy figure resembling Mario, who Peach got a glimpse of in the first two cutscenes, has been going around and covering the entirety of Al Delfino in this weird goop that everyone encountered. Not only that, but the vandalism has also caused their guardians, aka the island's main power source, the Shine Sprites, to vanish. Despite the fact that Mario very clearly did not do any of this, he is sentenced to clean the entirety of the island, along with recollecting all the Shine Sprites, otherwise he can't leave. I hereby order the defendant to clean this entire island. Until Isle Delfino is completely free of his vile handiwork, Mario shall not be allowed to leave. So fuck the Piantas, no one likes them and they suck. Yeah, that's the primary reason why most of the Mario fandom just hates these guys. They're obnoxious characters that falsely accuse Mario of something he didn't do. And before he was even ordered to clean the island, the first thing he did was clean up that goop on the airstrip. Mario is a literal hero and would have been a nice enough Samaritan to want to clean the island on his own will. So what the hell was the point of this framing storyline? Did Nintendo really want to do their own shadowy character story arc? Speaking of which, Shadow Mario appears throughout the game where he causes more vandalism and eventually kidnaps the princess. God damn it. But soon Mario finds out that he's actually a new character, Bowser Jr. Bowser's only biological son apparently, who kidnapped Peach because she's his mama? Leave my mama alone you bad man. I won't let you take mama Peach away. Mama? Mama Peach? Why does she seem hesitant to deny this? What the hell did Bowser tell his son to convince him of this? Also, a bit of lore is dropped during this cutscene. Bowser Jr, aka Shadow Mario, has been vandalizing the island by using his paintbrush. And the paintbrush is revealed to have been made by Professor E. Gad, a character introduced in Luigi's Mansion, who had built the Poltergeist 3000 for Luigi to capture ghosts with. E. Gad also made Flood too. So how the hell did Bowser Jr get his hands on this device? A strange old man in a white coat gave it to me. A strange old man. Wait, he said gave. He just gave it to him? Why? Why did he do that? So not only does Mario need to clean the rest of the island, but he also has to go save the princess from Bowser Jr. By the way, this is the last main cutscene until the very end, and you're only barely halfway through the game. You end up chasing down Shadow Mario in every level, and after you stop him for the seventh and last time, you're sent to a quick part of the game where Isle Delfino is completely flooded. For some reason, they don't really explain it. But Mario immediately chases down Shadow Mario through the unfortunately titled Corona Mountain, and once he catches up to Bowser Jr., he immediately encounters... Mario! How dare you disturb my family vacation! <laughs> Bowser, where the fuck were you during this whole game? Yeah, 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 Mario defeats Bowser again. They fall out the sky, with Peach gracefully hovering down because she's a queen, and she lands on a beach with Mario. Oh yeah, Flood was losing power during the fight with Bowser, so in this next cutscene, Flood dies. Mario, was I, um, assist, um, what the fuck? And they literally fix him in the next cutscene too. What the hell was even the point of that? For more drama? If anything, during the cutscene, I'm more distracted by how Mario has a neck. What the hell? So as Isle Delfino celebrates, Bowser and Bowser Jr. sit in defeat, with Jr. revealing to Bowser that he knows Peach isn't actually his mom. Jr., I've got something difficult to tell you about Princess Peach. I know, she's not really my mama. The plot of this game was pointless, but I will say in the very final cutscene, with Peach and Mario looking at the sunset on Serena Beach, I do love how the music in this cutscene is a nice rendition of the castle theme from the original Super Mario Brothers. It's a really nice rendition, I love the way this sounds.
and throughout the credits. We see various pictures of Mario, Peach, Flood, and everyone else enjoying their vacation, but I'm sure Mario's never gonna want to revisit this island after all the hell the people of Isle Delfino put him through. This is made even more apparent by how Mario has never gone back to this island to this day. Fuck the Piantas, dude. And that was the plot of Mario Sunshine. It's mostly pointless. I get that they wanted to have a premise to explain why Mario needed to clean the island, but at the same time, it just doesn't really add up. The Piantas are insufferable characters, and it's indirectly made worse by how later on, Mario can be seen chasing down and stopping Shadow Mario in front of everyone, but he's still treated like the bad guy by these people. It's just irritating. I like Shadow Mario as a concept, his design especially looks sick, but the whole framing story is just stupid and not well executed. Bowser Jr. only appears in like two or three cutscenes. For the most part, you're just dealing with his Shadow Mario form, and I kind of wish he kept the disguise on all the time because I'm not the biggest fan of Bowser Jr. He's really annoying and I don't like him, but I guess I am supposed to feel that way about him because he's the villain. He'd also obviously become a mainstay for the series and was probably the only thing from Sunshine that stuck with the franchise. I'm not too sure how to feel about that. The cutscenes themselves are fine. The presentation is solid, even though the random aspect ratio choice I brought up earlier is a bit strange. You can also enable subtitles on the cutscenes if you want. The only issue I have with these cutscenes is that you can't skip them unless you watch them once. Yeah, it's Conker's Bad Fur Day rolls. Also, the FMVs can be horribly pixelated if you're playing the game on an HD TV. Not sure if my Elgato captured that perfectly. When it comes to the voice acting, Hoo boy. Sunshine is the first and so far only mainline Mario game to have full-on voice acting in the cutscenes, and... Though it is daytime in Delfino Plaza, our poor residents tremble beneath a veil of darkness. Yeah, it's easy to see why. I think Mario and Peach sound fine, mainly because Charles Martinet never misses, and this was the first main Mario game to feature Jen Taylor as the princess, who's easily one of my favorite Peach voices. She'd go on to voice Peach in several future titles, and she's always a delight to hear. Toadsworth sounds okay, if a bit goofy, but the Toads themselves? This might be a hot take, but I fucking hate these Toad voices. Like, they're funny to make fun of, but I would hate to be stuck in a room with these guys for too long. God, I miss the early Toad voice from the N64 era. They sounded way less obnoxious there. Moving on, all the Piantas have terrible voices, and Bowser... Junior, I've got something difficult to tell you about Princess Peach. Sounds goofy as shit. It's like you're watching Sesame Street. I know, it's a kid's game, and it's also a Mario game, but good lord, was this really the best they could do? It really says a lot about how later in Galaxy and other games, the cutscenes would just be subtitled as most of the characters mumble their dialogue. It's really funny to me how Bowser spoke perfect English in Sunshine, but in Galaxy it's just... <laughs> Did Mario give him brain damage? What happened? I also do want to clarify this. I don't hate the voice acting. I just find it mostly cheesy and goofy for the most part. The cutscenes also aren't unwatchable or anything because of it. Most of them can be pretty short and are rather entertaining, with the only lengthy ones being the opening and closing cutscenes, but rightfully so. And a fun fact about the opening cutscene, the Japanese version of the game featured extra dialogue between Mario and Toadsworth, which you don't get to hear in any other version. There's even a few unused voice clips that had Mario speaking for sentences too. It's outrageous we weren't informed of this prior to our arrival. Who's in charge? Looks like a giant empty plate. How odd. What could have happened to the airstrip? Oh no, we're gonna be late for dinner. I imagine you'll be spending a fair amount of time at the princess's side. Hmm, look like a Mario's gonna have to find a job. Trying to start a new career at- I find it really funny that Nintendo were fine with the Piantas and Bowser having stupid voices, but drew the line at Mario talking. With that said, Sunshine probably has my favorite voice clips from Charles Martinet as Mario, mainly because some of them are reused from Mario 64 but just restored in better quality, and are mixed with new voice lines Charles recorded for Sunshine, and it makes them sound so youthful and energetic. Seriously, I love Mario's voice in this game. For my money, it's probably the best he ever sounded. Yeah. 
I'll just move on to the gameplay since I don't really have that much to say about the story. Mario's alone on this adventure again, but this time he's accompanied by the main gimmick of the game, Flood. You can use Flood by pressing the R trigger, which lets Mario spray water everywhere to clean up the goop, and he can even fight enemies using the water too. And because the game's on GameCube, its awesome controller has analog triggers. So if you press the R trigger down all the way, Mario stands in place as he shoots water, but if you slightly hold it down, you can run around while spraying. It's really useful. Flood has four different nozzles you can use, with three of them being unlockable. The main one you have is the spray nozzle, which is pretty self-explanatory. Another nozzle that you're gonna always have is the hover nozzle, which lets Mario hover in the air for a short while. It can be insanely useful for tough platforming, and it'll even spray goop on the ground below you. There are two other nozzles you can unlock later down the road, the first one being the rocket nozzle, which after holding down R for a few seconds, can launch Mario straight up in the air. This is probably my favorite nozzle. The last nozzle attachment is the turbo nozzle, which lets Mario build up this great burst of speed while on the ground, and even when swimming. It's a really powerful move, and it kind of reminds me of Sonic's boost. I am a Sonic fan, I had to make the comparison. Apart from those nozzle attachments, another cool move you can do is this blast attack by pressing the A button and the R trigger at the same time, and standing still while doing it will let Mario do a backflip. But you can run around and blast water everywhere by jumping. It is insanely useful during missions where you gotta clean up huge areas with goop. However, Flood can eventually run out of water, so you'll occasionally need to refill Flood by hopping in a pool of water, and hold R to refill. You can also stand near streams of water and they'll instantly refill Flood. Some levels also have these barrels of water you can smash open, and there are some cases during boss fights and whatnot where the game will drop these water bottles for you to pick up. But this can be incredibly rare. I always thought the water bottle items looked interesting. I always appreciated the GameCube library's sense of experimentation, and the Flood gimmick in Mario Sunshine is one of those things I really like. Flood is a pretty fun mechanic on its own, and it would only ever appear in Sunshine, apart from Mario's future down B in Smash Brothers. Apparently, Flood was initially gonna be a water gun until he was eventually just made into a backpack with a water nozzle attached to it. I'm glad they went this route, but still, could you imagine that? Mario walking around with a gun? Wait, are you telling me Super Gangsta Mario could have been canon? So, Flood on its own is a pretty decent gimmick, but let's talk about Mario himself. To put it blunt, Mario's gameplay is a bit of a letdown from 64. His controls are still solid, but unless you're using Flood most of the time, Mario's actual moves can be a bit lackluster. He can jump on enemies like before and even has his ground pound. His triple jump is also back and is still great, but that's pretty much all he really has returning from 64. He can't punch or kick anymore, which, yeah, that's it's not a huge deal, you do have Flood, but one of the stranger design choices in Sunshine is that you can't crouch anymore, which also means you can't do a regular backflip or the long jump. I don't care who you are, a 3D Mario game without the long jump is so disappointing. But would it have really improved Sunshine? Yes. With that said, though, not having the long jump isn't necessarily the end of the world. He does still have the dive, which can be a good substitute. And a pretty neat thing you can do is spray water on the floor in front of you, and when you dive on it, Mario's gonna slide really fast. This can really come in handy in the more time-based missions. While you can't punch and kick anymore, you do still have the ability to pick up items and toss them. But the coolest move that Mario has in the game, in my opinion, is the spin jump, which you can do by quickly rotating the analog stick and jumping at the right time. And it can actually let Mario stay airborne for a pretty good while. The spin jump is so cool, and I'm kind of shocked it didn't become a staple move in every future 3D Mario game. It could be really handy for some of the more difficult platforming challenges. You can even perform the jump while spraying with Flood. It's a lot of fun. So while Mario does have other moves that can really make up for the lack of the long jump, whenever I go back to this game, I just can't help but wonder, why exactly was the long jump taken out the game? The GameCube controller is easily one of my favorite controllers of all time, but did they really not have enough buttons? buttons to work with? The controller has a Z button, and it is used, but it's only for bringing up the guidebook map screen, nothing else. I personally think it was a really dumb idea to dedicate the Z button to this screen, when they probably could have moved it somewhere else. Remember the microscopic D-pad on the GameCube controller? Well, I guess it was too tiny for the developers as well, because it's never used in the game, apart from a few menus. So why didn't they just map the guidebook screen to the D-pad? That way the Z button could have been used for something more useful. And jumping forward for a bit, ever heard of the mod? 
mod Super Mario Sunburn. It's a fan effort to make the definitive version of Mario Sunshine, and one of the very things it does is remap the guidebook to the D-pad, and it uses the Z button for crouching. Yes, Sunburn actually restored the long jump and the backflip, which to me kind of proves that there was a way for them to keep these moves in the game, but they just didn't do it. I'll tackle this mod a bit more later, but I highly recommend it to any Mario Sunshine fan if you haven't played it yet. But getting back to regular Sunshine, at some points during the game, Flood will be taken away from Mario and you'll have to go through a platforming challenge to get a Shine Sprite. These secret courses are a mixed bag for me, but the main reason is that it kind of highlights all the good and bad aspects of Mario's controls. Mario's physics are weirdly tight and inconsistent. Like sometimes he'll stand on slanted terrain just fine, and other times he'll slide off. I don't get it. Plus the lack of a long jump in these levels is a bit confusing because the R trigger's not being used anymore, mainly because you don't have flood. So why can't we use the move here? The controls can take some getting used to, but if I'm being perfectly honest, this might be my least favorite 3D controls and physics in a mainline Mario game. Seriously, for anyone who's gonna argue otherwise, I assure you, go replay the Galaxy games, or hell, Super Mario Odyssey. I don't care if you don't like that game's open world approach or its larger levels, I'm talking about the controls, man. It is perfection. However, what's probably the worst part of Mario Sunshine's controls has to be, get this, the swimming. It could be slow as hell, and how the fuck did 64 still have better swim controls? I probably wouldn't care so much because you only really swim a couple of times in the game, but seeing how this is the water-focused Mario game, why is the swimming terrible? Focusing on the positives, for the most part, uh, oh, this is the first 3D Mario game to feature Yoshi. But before you can use Yoshi, you gotta hatch him from his egg, usually by bringing him a certain fruit. After that, you can ride around on Yoshi and he can eat certain enemies and food, along with being able to use his iconic flutter jump. You can also hop off Yoshi by pressing X. Yoshi can also projectile vomit, which functions kind of similar to Flood's spray nozzle. You mainly use this to remove these weird magma formations in certain levels. Yoshi's great for platforming and is a lot of fun in 3D, however, he does have issues. First off, you see that meter on the bottom right? That's Yoshi's stomach, which means he can run out of fluid and just evaporate while you're riding him, so you gotta remember to eat fruit whenever you can, otherwise Yoshi will just fucking die. Speaking of Yoshi dying, he's definitely allergic to water in this game. Seriously, if you drop him in water, he just evaporates and dies. Now, this makes literally zero sense if you played the previous games, but when you look at it in a more lore reasoning, the Yoshis in Sunshine aren't normal ones. They're fabrications apparently made by EGAD's paintbrush that Bowser Jr. has, which is why they can't travel in water and don't live for too long. I'm not really sure why they decided to handicap Yoshi in this game, but I guess if you just remember to feed him and avoid water, he'll be fine. There's also a pretty funny glitch you can do where if you use Yoshi's tongue and immediately hop off, it'll mess up his model for a bit. Also, yes, he obviously plays better in Galaxy 2. He could even swim in water just fine. How embarrassing. I love this game's art style so much. This is easily one of my favorite looking GameCube games. The summer themes are pulled off really well. The heat wave effects are a nice touch, but it can also hurt to stare at if you're playing this game with a bad headache. It's also the only game where Mario has his sleeves rolled up, which is another great touch. While the game looks colorful and pretty, the water graphics are a whole new level of impressive. Seriously, this game might honestly have the best looking water I've ever seen in a video game. It's so visually nice and even the splashing looks amazing. I think the biggest disappointment here is the 30 FPS cap. I think this game would have really flourished in 60 frames. But if we do remember in some of the early builds of the game, it was suffering from some pretty bad slowdown. And once again bringing up Super Mario Sunburn real quick, it has an option to play the game in 60 frames a second, but you can also get the game to run on Wii and Wii U using homebrew software like Nintendo. However, if you play the game there with the 60 FPS mode enabled, it'll sometimes run beautifully, but a lot of slowdown can occur. And I personally think it further demonstrates that capping the frame rate at 30 was probably implemented last minute. Again, the 30 FPS doesn't ruin the game, and I only really noticed frame rate issues during some of the later parts, but it is a shame they couldn't get it to run at 60 with zero issues. If only there was a beautiful man who worked at the company at the time with a passion for coding who could have sorted this issue out before the game's release, similar to what he did for previous major franchises in the past.
Okay, to be fair, he was acting Nintendo president at the time. He was probably busy doing other shit. And with all that said about the frame rate, the game still running at 30 FPS in 3D All-Stars is inexcusable. But I'll talk more about that crap later. I think the soundtrack has its own appeal to it. It was composed by the one and only Koji Kondo, alongside Shinobu Tanaka. And I think it's one of the most charming soundtracks ever made for a Mario game. Maybe not as iconic as 64 or as legendary as the Mario Galaxy soundtracks, but I still really love Mario Sunshine's music. And one really cute detail is that when you're writing Yoshi, you'll hear this added drum beat to the music, which is a callback to when Super Mario World also did this, which is a detail I somehow forgot to mention in my Mario World review, and I've been kicking myself about it ever since. Also, fun fact, there are unused music tracks in the game that have Yoshi drums on them, with some of these music tracks being made for levels in the game that Yoshi doesn't even appear in. Interesting. I'll be sure to highlight a few of my favorite songs when I look at the levels, but I will say, even though I'm not personally big on the secret courses, I do love the music in them. It is a fantastic a cappella version of the Super Mario Brothers theme, and it's easily one of the best songs in the game. <laughs> Also, as much as 3D All-Stars really dropped the ball in a lot of areas, I do appreciate that this collection did give us an official release of Sunshine's music. Since this game never really got one before, unlike all the other 3D games, this would even include the background music from the cutscenes, which, to my knowledge, were never really released before. That's pretty cool. Still a crap collection, but cool. The main hub area for Mario Sunshine is Delfino Plaza. Not my favorite hub area in a Mario game, but I always like this little town that you can run around in. The music is so catchy and perfect, and I also really like traveling on the rooftops. You're even able to ride Yoshi and use all the flood upgrades here too. You can even ground pound on these sewer covers to go underground. It's a lot of fun. Just like Peach's Castle before it, Delfino Plaza was notably made into a level in the Smash Brothers franchise, first appearing in Brawl, and it has you flying all around the area. Area. It's easily one of the most memorable stages, and it also kind of appears that they just used the original level map to make the stage. And weirdly enough, the sewer covers in Brawl use a beta design instead of the final one. But back to Sunshine, Delfino Plaza is home to all the gates that access the stages. There are 7 to 8 levels in the game, and the main goal is that you have to collect all the Shine Sprites. This game's equivalent to 64's Power Stars, which are spread all across the island. And there's even some hidden shines you can find in the hub area. The levels themselves have have 8 episodes you can play through, but there's also 3 more shines you can get, which means there's 11 shine sprites in total for all 7 main levels. I love how when you grab a shine, it just says SHINE, which is really funny because in Japan, the prompt was originally SHINE GET, so all they did was just take the GET part out and just called it a day. Of the missions slash episodes you gotta play through to get the shine sprites, this game brought back both the red coins and the 100 coin missions, and both were made worse. In 64, usually you only only had to do one red coin mission per level, but in Sunshine, the red coin missions are way overused, often having like three or four red coin missions per level. Remember the secret courses I brought up earlier? Well, you can revisit them using Flood, but the main reason you go back here is because you have to do a red coin mission. You're also on a time limit, which can be very strict. Plus, the red coins don't even count as two extra coins anymore either, let alone one. Why would they take that away? Oh yeah, and those hundred coin missions, while they were still a pain in the ass in 64, in Sunshine, oh my god. Two things, why were these brought back, and why were they made so much worse? Each level can have a very scarce amount of coins, along with them being spread way too far apart. And remember how I said there were 8 episodes per level? Well, only certain episodes have enough coins for you to collect, and even if you choose the right episode, it can still take forever to reach 100, so there will very likely be a lot of points where you'll maybe reach around 70 to 80 coins, and you'll just run around the level for minutes on end, sometimes for an hour straight. Also, in 64, when you got 100 coins, the star appeared right above you, which could be both good or bad depending on where you got the star to spawn. But in Sunshine, when you get 100 coins, the shine sprite just goes to a designated location, which can be a little obnoxious depending on how far it goes away from you. However, when you collect any shine sprite, even the 100 coin ones, the game kicks you out the level, which is nothing at all like how in 64 where when you get 
get the 100 coin star, the game would still let you stay in the level so you can grab another star, and, well, this leads to a pretty annoying design choice with Sunshine. The game doesn't let you collect the Shine Sprites out of order. You have to beat the first seven episodes in every level, mainly because those episodes lead to you chasing down Shadow Mario, and you need to chase him down in every level so you can access the final area of the game. This is a pretty idiotic choice for Sunshine to do, which, again, Mario 64 didn't force you to do. All you had to do was just collect 70 stars. It didn't matter which order or which stars you collected. Just get them and that's it. So I'm really annoyed that Sunshine didn't do this. It feels very restrictive and almost forces the game to be more linear. Not that linearity is bad, I just don't think Sunshine executed this very well. And I'll explain why when I highlight the levels later. And I don't mean to keep comparing this game to Mario 64 so much, especially since I still really like Sunshine a fair amount, but I really can't ignore this aspect. If you are going to 100% Mario Sunshine, it is going to be one of the most difficult and time-consuming tasks you'll ever do in any 3D Mario game. There are 120 Shine Sprites in total. Get it? It's the same number of stars in Mario 64. That's 11 in every main level, and when you look at the hub area alone, Delfino Plaza has 40 Shines for you to get. Well, technically there's just 16, but when it comes to the remaining 24 Shines, those can be be collected from the BLUE COINS! Okay, if you're as big a fan of Mario 64 as I am, then you will most likely feel that the way the blue coins were handled in Mario Sunshine is easily one of the most disappointing and annoying aspects of the game. In 64, they were a bit rare to come across, and when you grabbed them, they gave you five coins. They were awesome. In Sunshine, they're way more common and can be carefully hidden in several levels. But picking them up doesn't earn you five coins anymore. So, why do you need to collect the blue coins? Well, when you access the second gate in the game, you can come across this little store being ran by these two raccoons, where if you trade at least 10 blue coins with them, then they'll give you... SHINE SPRITES! There are 24 Shine Sprites you can get from them by doing this. Which means if you are going after every Shine, then there are 240 blue coins you also have to collect. 240? I get it, they doubled the number of Shine Sprites and Power Stars because they thought it'd be cute, but was it really worth it? What was originally my favorite type of coin to collect in Mario 64 has now become one of the most obnoxious collectibles in Mario Sunshine. And each level has 30 blue coins. Coins. The hub area has 20, and the last area only has 10, but I'll get to that shit later. The main problem isn't necessarily the number, but more that the blue coins can be hidden in really cryptic locations. Like needing to spray those blue birds in the air, I hate those bastards. Plus, they can even be locked behind specific episodes and levels. So not every blue coin can be found in just one episode. Why? Why waste my time with this shit? Why would you do this? You know what, this is actually good design. It really pads out the game time. I mean, it feels more intuitive to play, totally. The blue coins are terrible, and even from a story perspective, why the hell are these raccoon characters allowed to hold these shine sprites for ransom? They're the guardian slash main power source for the island. They arrested Mario, but not these two? You can't recollect the blue coins either, which I know means basically nothing to everyone else, but I still kind of wish they counted as five coins when you picked them up. Could you imagine using the blue coins during the 100 coin missions? Don't you think they would have made these missions less time consuming? By the way, this would be the last game to feature the blue coins in any way, or at least in this type of scope. So thank you Mario Sunshine for senselessly killing my favorite item from Mario 64. You must be great at parties. Again, going for 100% in the game can be a complete pain in the ass, and I think most of everyone watching can agree that Mario Sunshine is probably the most difficult game in the series to complete. Maybe technically Mario Odyssey kind of outdoes Sunshine, but I personally think that game was way better structured in every aspect, to a point where the more difficult moons to grab don't entirely matter because there's also much easier moons you can run around and grab instead. So Odyssey has an amazing balance and still holds up after 7 years. But Sunshine just didn't give a fuck and it really shows after 22 years. By the way, this video is dedicated to my good friend Gabriel King Pikmin. This is his favorite Mario game. Yes, this one. Here's a picture of him with his son. So I'm just gonna jump to talking about the levels and all the stuff I love and hate about them. Hope you're enjoying the video so far, Gabe. Also, Raichu's better. Please don't harass my friend, this was a joke. Before you really start the game, the first task you have to do is at the Delfino airstrip. Here you find Flood, watch a little tutorial video, then you gotta go clear up your first bit of goop in the game. This also leads to a quick mini boss known as the Gatekeeper, who can also spawn these little dudes known as Swoop and Stews, which hop around and can cover Mario and goop. 
It's actually a really cool detail seeing Mario get all dirtied up, but it does start draining your health if you get covered up too much. You fight the gatekeepers a few more times in the game, and you also have to fight them to access two levels, which are Rico Harbor and Galato Beach. The airstrip is a solid intro for the game, and you could even come back here at the cost of just 10 coins, mainly so you could do a quick red coin mission and find a blue coin. There's also a lot of added coins here, so it could be really useful for getting the 100 coin mission in the hub area. The first level is Bianco Hills, a pretty decent starting level with a bunch of windmills you can hop around on, along with a big area and a lake and another huge windmill to climb on. One thing I really like is how the goop in every level can look different, with Bianco Hills having its goop colored like a chocolate swirl, or at least I hope it's chocolate. Bianco Hills also has these bungee cords you can bounce on, and they're one of my absolute favorite gimmicks in the game and they appear in a few levels. You can even dangle off them and swing using Flood. You're also able to hang off them using just Mario's nose, but it can be a little tricky to pull off. The first mission has you taking care of another gatekeeper, but later on you have to travel at the top of the bigger windmill, where you'll come across the first actual boss of the game, and it's a new character in their first ever appearance, Petey Piranha. Petey has a quick cutscene before his fight, but unlike the other cutscenes which are letterboxed, his is in 4x3. In fact, both the opening and Petey's fight are the only cutscenes in the game that aren't letterboxed. That's so random. Anyways, the boss fight with Petey involves him spitting goop everywhere, and he even causes a swoop and stews to appear. You just have to wait for him to open his mouth and spray inside of him, then it'll get full and fall over, leaving you an opening the ground pound on his stomach, as the three-dimensional arrow points you to do. For the first boss fight, it's not too difficult, but Sunshine unfortunately kind of messed this up too. In almost every level, for whatever reason, this game really likes reusing boss fights at any chance it gets, so you have to fight PD two times in the level, both in the second and fifth episodes, with the fifth episode dragging out the the fight since Petey's now flying, so you gotta keep knocking him down to the ground just so you can beat him the exact same way again. Reusing elements like this can get pretty repetitive and dull after a while, especially if it was a boss fight that took too long to beat. Though, during the second fight, Petey can drop these weird piranha plant enemies? Yeah, despite the classic enemies being present in 64, Sunshine actually went for a more unique approach for the enemies in terms of both originality and designs. Like, I don't think a single Koopa or Goomba appear anywhere in this game, at least not in their normal forms. It's kind of crazy when you think about it, but I also kind of appreciate Sunshine for doing this. One detail I really love about most levels is how, if you stare off in the distance, you can see the other levels in the background from afar. You can't travel to them, but I always really like this detail. It's such cool world building. And in case you guys were wondering, episode 8 is best for getting the 100 coin mission. I'd recommend looking up which episodes you should go to to get the 100 coin missions done. What great design, making me write down where I should go so I don't have as miserable a time getting every shine sprite. Oh, Bianco Hills also introduces the beehives. The bees themselves can be annoying as hell, but you can use Yoshi to eat them. Plus, you can knock down the beehives, and even though it'll cause all the bees to swarm after you, Using Yoshi to button mash B will make him eat every B, and each B can be an individual coin too, and it could even give you a blue coin. So yeah, while they can be annoying, the beehives can also be super helpful for the 100 coin mission. And here's one last tip for Bianco Hills. When going for 100 coins, spray the Sanbo head enemies into the walls. That way they'll drop 3 coins instead of just 1. Thank you, InStyle. The second level is Rico Harbor, and this is easily one of my favorite levels in the game. I love the platforming and the scenery, there's also these fences you can climb on, which are pretty cute callbacks to Super Mario World. The scale in this level can be a lot of fun to explore, and there's also a pretty fun mission where you gotta travel up these platforms to get a caged shine sprite, but you could just use the jet nozzle to perform a quick shortcut. Rico Harbor also probably has my favorite music track in the game. It's so bouncy and wonderful, it's just perfect. The main boss you fight here is known as Gooper Blooper, who pops out of a box and can attack Mario using his tentacles. The boss is... 
okay. But also kind of violent because it involves you needing to rip off Cooper's arms. And then you yank on his face to really smack the dude up. You have to do that two times in the fight. You also end up fighting him again in a later episode and in a future level. Fun fact, in early builds of the game, Gooper Blooper was originally Teal, which I found pretty interesting. So I've been mostly positive with Rico Harbor, but the worst missions in this level are easily the ones where you have to ride the bloopers on the water. The concept of riding on top of a blooper jetting across the ocean is really fun, but the way this game executed it was pretty stupid. You can choose between three bloopers and each of them have differences. Green bloopers are the slowest but have the best turning, pink bloopers are the fastest but have the worst turning, and yellow bloopers can be pretty balanced. But the issue is that Mario becomes super fragile when he's on a blooper, because if he so much as nudges a wall, he dies. I don't know why they designed the bloopers to be instant kill, but it can be really annoying, especially if you're trying to collect the red coins and have to keep restarting. Also, holy shit, I really clutched that damn 100 coin mission in Rico Harbor. Seriously, I managed to rack up like 70 to 80 coins, but then I was running around the level for like 20 minutes trying to find more. I was even stuck at 99 for a bit, which annoyed the hell out of me and I almost reset the level, until I eventually came across the blooper enemy I somehow missed, which dropped the one last coin I needed. So thank you and rest in peace, random blooper enemy. You really saved my ass. I haven't really spoken too much about the secret courses. I think these levels are fine, but I personally don't care too much about them. I think my issue, again, mainly lies with the rough physics and controls with Mario here. And I always find it a bit strange when I hear people say that the secret courses are actually the best parts of the game for them. Really? I mean, I guess the levels are more about traditional platforming and testing your skills, like the classic games, but I think another issue of mine is how these courses can really feel like a chore to play through. I also heard a few people claim that the levels in Mario Galaxy were only good because they were basically the secret courses in Sunshine. I disagree. I feel like Galaxy's levels are good because they took the outlandish concepts of Sunshine's secret courses and just perfected them more. I also feel like people who genuinely feel that way about Galaxy are just flood haters for no reason. But speaking of Mario Galaxy, the secret course from Rico Harbor would actually be brought back in Galaxy 2 as Twisty Trials Galaxy, and if you play both versions of these levels back to back like I did, it really highlights it's the rough control issues with Sunshine even more because Galaxy has stellar controls. Plus, Twisty Trials has the cloud power-up, which could greatly help the level become easier for certain players. The third level is Galato Beach, the first level in the game to be centered around a beach, and it's also the first level where I feel totally mixed about the missions. The beach area itself is really nice and I really like the music, but this place is also home to one of the most annoying enemies in the franchise, the Cataquax. These fuckers can run up to Mario and just toss him straight in the air, which can take away a bit of his health. There are these little plants in the ground you can spray known as dune buds, which can cause these formations to appear out the ground, and you can even use these to kill the Cataquax on the beach. I didn't know about that until making this review. Some of these dune buds can help you with finding missions and other shine sprites. This can include playing through a secret course like before, and the sandbird. The sandbird is terrible, mainly because it slowly flies in the air, and it even rotates. The combination of a shifting level terrain and Mario's rough physics can lead to instant frustration if you end up sliding off the damn bird. The sandbird is a red coin mission, so if you end up falling off the sandbird, you gotta redo the entire slow flying section, easily making this one of the more annoying and tedious red coin missions. There's even some blue coins you can hover past that are on clouds. It's almost like they put them here just to taunt the player, like, hey, we know the sandbird sucks and can take forever, but look, there's also some blue coins, which also means if you aren't able to grab the blue coins the first time, you have no choice but to come back to the sandbird later, so that's fun. Another mission involves ground pounding on these mirror platforms to get these enemies off them, which will direct light to this tower that'll break apart this green wiggler. I love the mirror effect on these platforms. Maybe they look a bit blurry nowadays, but I personally still think the graphics here hold up well. Also, the green wigger appears in a future mission where you have to fight him. This is one of the few instances in the game where you only have to fight a boss fight one time, and this one involves you triggering the sand formations to flip over the wiggler, and then ground pound on whichever body part the 3D arrow's pointing to. Fun fact about these sand formations, one of them looks like a pile 
pile of shit, mainly because it is one. Seriously, the name of this particular sand formation in the files is literally Sandbomb Base Shit. They put an actual turd in a Mario game. Gelato Beach is also the first time you encounter Piantissimo, a possible racist stereotype character wearing a Piana outfit who challenges Mario to a foot race. He's basically Sunshine's version of Koopa the Quick, and you end up racing him in three different levels. Plus, another interesting fact about him that I'm sure most people are aware of, but fans ripped his model from the game and found out that his mask is removable, revealing that he bears a striking resemblance to a character from the Zelda franchise, being the running man from Ocarina of Time slash the postman from Majora's Mask. I'm not sure if this was ever really confirmed to be the same character, but it's still a cute easter egg. Okay, back to bitching. The red coin missions in this level are total garbage. I already brought up the sandbird, but the second red coin mission where you gotta go swim for them is also terrible. This is both because of how the swimming controls suck, and there are two red coins that are moving around. And to make it worse, they can even clip through the damn walls! Who the hell thought this was a good idea? It makes no sense sense and it really pads out the mission. There's even a blue coin or two that does that as well, and it's just as irritating. This next thing also isn't really a complaint, but I noticed when standing on this rock and moving around, the layers of water kept popping in and out. What's that about? However, the worst mission in Galato Beach is easily Episode 8, the Watermelon Festival. This mission involves you needing to bring this huge watermelon from the top of the mountain all the way down to the little hut on the beach. The issue here is that this is the most fragile watermelon ever because it can pop from the roughest interaction from Mario and even those damn cataquacks on the beach. I'd highly recommend using the dune buzz to get a bunch of the cataquacks out the way, though there's no way to get rid of the ones on the upper sections. Still, if you roughen up the watermelon too much, it explodes and you'll have to travel all the way back up the mountain and try getting the damn watermelon down all the way again. I kinda lucked out while doing this mission while recording, but that doesn't negate the fact that this is easily one of the most difficult missions in the entire game. While while Galato Beach wouldn't appear in another Mario game, Mario Kart Double Dash and Mario Kart Wii would feature a tribute to it in the form of Peach Beach. Here you can see the Piantas in the background cheering for you while racing, and it also features the Cataquacks walking around the main beach area as obstacles. The Cataquacks here are also multicolored, or more multicolored I should say, since Sunshine only had red and blue ones while Mario Kart introduced these new purple and green ones. All of them act the exact same, but I do like how they look a bit more varied in later games. Next is Peanut Park, the fourth level and the first to have two different sections to it. It's also the only level to have a cutscene before it, showing Shadow Mario kidnap Peach. The first area has a small little beach in it, it's also where you can do missions to restore these flowers, and there's a cannon with a Monty Mo in it sending missiles, and tossing out these unique looking bob bombs Yeah, instead of using the classic bob bombs from the previous games, Sunshine redesigned them to look more modern it seems, with them having a digital face and a countdown clock. To my knowledge, this is the only only game in the series to use these more modern bob bombs and I kind of like the way they look. I wish they got used more. Also, the missiles getting sent at you can spawn an endless amount of coins, meaning Episode 2 is the perfect one to go to if you're trying to get 100 coins. There's even these special gold missiles that can drop even more coins. After you toss 3 bob bombs back at the Monty Bowl, you can jump inside the cannon, leading to a secret course, which is just as good and bad as the others, but these ones have cute Yoshi's Island backgrounds in them. The beach area also has these swipe and stews who can actually swoop down and steal Mario's hat in the only part of the game where Mario can lose his hat. However, unlike in 64 when Mario remained just fine without his hat, apart from taking double damage, in Sunshine, Mario losing his hat just makes him slowly lose health? What's that about? Is Mario dying from heatstroke or something? Man, this list just keeps getting bigger and bigger, Gabe. The second area in Peanut Park is, well, the park, which features a bunch of spinning pirate ships, these Yoshi she merry-go-rounds, a ferris wheel, and more importantly, a roller coaster. You can ride the roller coaster for two missions, with the first one being the boss fight with Mecha Bowser, and this fight kinda drags. Since you're on the roller coaster, you're constantly moving while collecting missiles to shoot at Mecha Bowser, along with trying to avoid oncoming missiles and fire breath, both of which can be stopped using Flood. You send about five missiles at Mecha Bowser, and that's it. It's not a super difficult fight, but it can be pretty time-consuming. That said, I'd rather replay 
play the Mecha Bowser fight over the balloon mission in Episode 8, where you gotta go around the roller coaster shooting these balloons. This mission honestly wouldn't have been so awful if it didn't force you to pop all the balloons in just three laps. And if you don't succeed, Mario will just fall off the ride and die. Was he sniped or something? Why does it kill him? I nearly had to do this mission three times, but I ended up getting a few lucky shots at the end and got the shine sprite. Other than that, fuck this mission. Other aspects of Pino Park to mention is that you get to ride Yoshi here, and you even have to use them to access one of the secret courses in the merry-go-round, which is pretty fitting considering those courses have Yoshi's Island themed backgrounds. While I said there aren't any Goombas in this game, there was an interesting thing that people found in Pino Park's files. There's this hidden 2D artwork in the level of this small Goomba character that the game's files label as Cuck, and he actually has a paper-thin character model with a few unused animations. According to the Cutting Room he was likely a test character for the developers, but I wanted to mention him because I think he looks pretty cute, and he's probably the only Goomba character in the game. One last thing I'll mention about Pino Park was, while I was collecting the blue coins, I managed to pull off some sick parkour shit to get this one blue coin out of reach. <laughs> The fifth level is Serena Beach, Gabriel's favorite level. And while it does have beach in a name, most of the main missions actually take place inside of a hotel, Hotel Delfino. Though the first mission involves Mario having to clean up this electric goop everywhere, which got spread around by this giant manta ray that eventually comes back for Mario to fight. I actually really enjoy this boss fight. I know some people may find it annoying, and it could also suffer from some pretty bad slowdown at points, but I just like spraying down the manta ray and making it break apart. I'd highly recommend using the black it causes a great amount of damage to the tiny manta rays, and it also clears out a lot of the electric goop. I like the sunset in this beach area, it's really pretty. And even the final cutscene in the game with Mario and Peach staring at the sunset takes place at Serena Beach, which is pretty cool. There's another mission later where you don't fight the manta ray again, but you do have to clean up the electric goop for a second time, though now you're on a time limit. It can be nerve wracking at first, but again, just keep using the blast and it should clear everything up quickly. So the missions outside the hotel are a pretty decent time, but the missions inside the hotel are kinda dull. This is the main part of the game where you get to see the booze. There's the regular ones who turn invisible and can even disguise themselves as coins to fool you. Even blue coins? That's just pure evil. There's also these pink booze that you can spray to create these block platforms. They kinda remind me of Starburst. And then there are these bigger booze that are sleeping in the vents that you can't harm at all. To make it worse, these ghosts are actually blocking the path that you have to go to get a shine sprite. The only way you can get past these boozes by having Yoshi eat them. But getting Yoshi is a whole different story. There is a mission where you can see a shine sprite literally out in the open, right in the pole area, but you're not permitted to get past the Beyonce guarding it because you're not wearing the right swim gear. The whole fucking premise of the damn game is that Mario needs to collect all the shine sprites in order to help restore Isle Delfino, which is where all the Piantas live. So why are they keeping Mario away from collecting this one shine sprite? Just give it to him! Anyways, instead of simply letting Mario get past and collect the shine sprite, you have to go to a specific hotel room that has its door open, jump into the ceiling to access the ventilation system, find the correct for the ground pound through, smash through another four to reach an even lower level, smash open a box that has a pineapple that Yoshi needs, bring the fucking pineapple back to Yoshi, use Yoshi to travel all the way through the vents again, eat the ghosts to get them out the fucking way, yet again try to find the right goddamn four to smash through, land in the pole area, grab the shine sprite, save your progress, take the game out the GameCube, then throw it down the fucking stairs. <laughs> Yeah, this mission's not very fun. Apart from the vents and hotel rooms, there's also a casino area, which you go to in order to play one of the secret courses, though getting to it is a bit obnoxious. You have to spray two different slot machines to get three sevens, and then you have to spray this really annoying flip puzzle. The smallest drop of water can flip one of these pieces, so you can get stuck here for a little bit if you can't stop making the pieces move because you keep accidentally spraying them. However, the casino also contains another boss fight, which is with... 
King Boo, what? That's what the Mario Wiki calls him, but he looks nothing at all like King Boo in Luigi's Mansion, and he's technically a big Boo if anything. Anyways, this boss fight has a slot machine that can cause coins, enemies, and different foods to appear. You mainly focus on grabbing the pepper and tossing it at Boo's tongue, and then grab a different fruit and toss it at him to hurt him. It's an okay boss, and you thankfully don't need to fight it twice. Oh yeah, the blue coins in this level can be a little obnoxious to collect. A lot of them are locked behind certain hotel rooms, which means you're gonna have to travel back up through the vent maze over and over again until you find out how to reach them. At one point, I managed to get 29 out of the 30 coins, but I got stuck trying to find the last one for like 30 to 40 minutes, until I eventually came across it in a random hotel room that I somehow missed. I was streaming this game for friends while recording, and we were all flabbergasted that I somehow missed this one hotel room. Did I mention yet that this game is not fun to 100%? I don't have too much else to say about this level or the secret courses, but while recording the second secret course, I did pull off this huge save. <laughs> That was insane. Another huge highlight for my sunshine career. Enough bitching, Cooper. People are gonna leave dislikes and complain about you in the comments. As per usual. But we're finally at my favorite level in the game, which is Noki Bay, the sixth level, and I just love the overall scale of this place. It probably has my favorite scenery in the game. The first few missions do have this poisonous water at first, but it eventually gets cleared up and the level becomes even more open for you to explore. The platforming is a lot of fun, and the bungee cords make another appearance too. I especially love how you can spray certain walls and get access to even more more platforming sections, like spraying goop off the walls to get these platforms to grow out, and these walls that you can push in to make these small areas appear. It's so fun! The first red coin mission is also one of the more interesting ones, with Mario getting shrunk down into this little bottle. You do have to put up with the shitty swimming controls again, but it's still a pretty cool mission in the game. However, this mission is also home to probably one of the most unexplained easter eggs in gaming. There's this little thing with two holes in it that you can swim into, but if you swim into one of these and then switch the camera to Mario, if you angle it just right, you can see this random door with a book behind it. You can't open the door or collect the book in any way. They're just a random object placed here for no reason. And yes, I said they're an object singular, because fans ripped the models from this game and discovered that the door and the book are attached to each other, which is a bit strange. To this day, fans have no clue what the purpose of this book was, or why it's even in the game. It's almost like the L is real star statue of sunshine, though just being real, I'm gonna assume the book doesn't really have that much meaning and the game devs just placed it here as a cute easter egg. It's pretty random. There's one original boss fight in Noki Bay and it takes place completely underwater. The boss is Ely Mouth, a giant sea creature who has rotten teeth, and all you have to do is just spray down all his teeth using Flood. It's a pretty cool concept for a fight and it's probably my favorite one in the game, though it can drag on a bit. You also only have to fight it once, but you do have to travel back here for the second red coin mission. This was probably the only mission in Noki Bay I found a little annoying, since the red coins are attached to this pretty cute looking fish made entirely of coins, but the coins can randomly break away for a brief time. So unless you get really lucky with these garbage swimming controls, this mission can take a while. I will say, while this is still my favorite level, I am kind of bothered by one thing about the swimming missions. At the start of these missions, Mario gets given this water bowl on his head. The water bowl helps Mario breathe underwater for a little longer. However, I'm I'm genuinely confused about why it doesn't just let Mario breathe underwater. That's what I initially thought the helmet was used for, but no, you're still running out of breath. It's a little weird, but you can still refill your health by collecting coins. While Noki Bay has one original boss fight, it also reuses one from a previous level, which is Gooper Blooper from Rico Harbor. Yeah, you have to fight him a third time here, and it's the exact same boss fight. Kinda makes you wonder why they reuse the exact same boss fights with little to no change. One quick mission you do is racing Piantissimo again, and it's probably the easiest race. Like, there's no real set path for you to race on, you just have to head to the flagpole and that's it. There's no penalty for using shortcuts. The Shadow Mario chase can be a bit more time consuming compared to the others since this level is larger and Shadow Mario can travel pretty far up. But while chasing him in Noki Bay, I discovered something pretty interesting about these chases. I knocked Shadow Mario over but ended up falling down, and upon traveling back up, I discovered that Shadow Mario can actually get back up and start running around again. I never knew he behaved like this until I was recording footage. It's like his damn health bar was refilled. Oh yeah, Shadow Mario actually does 
does have a health bar, and you can make it pop up by using an action replay code. The final game obviously doesn't display it, but I do find it pretty interesting that he does have an HP meter, but the game just doesn't show it. I wonder why. And in terms of other annoying missions here, the last episode Shine Sprite can actually be found from a golden bird that's on this higher up section in the level. Yes, you have to spray this tiny ass bird just to get a Shine Sprite, which can be just as annoying as spraying down the blue birds to get those blue coins. Speaking of the blue coins, I didn't struggle too hard getting them in this level, but there was one particular blue coin that caused me a lot of trouble, and it also nearly killed my 120 Shine Sprite run. There is a specific blue coin in this level that you have to wall jump to, which sounds simple enough, except for the fact that sometimes when you grab the blue coin, the game will suddenly... <laughs> Yes, for whatever reason, this one blue coin in Noki Bay has a tendency to crash the damn game. This is the only blue coin that can crash the game, and no one has any clue why. But it happened to me like four times while recording, until the game, I guess, finally threw me a bone and let me grab the coin without an issue. The glee I felt when I finally grabbed the blue coin was unreal. Like, I was so relieved, you guys. I've heard the best way to avoid the game crashing is to just jump at the blue coin from a certain angle, so I guess I just got lucky here. With that said, why the hell did this have to happen in my favorite level of all places? Why Noki Bay? It's like the game itself knew I was having too good of a time here, and then just decided to pull this shit just to throw me off. This is some creepypasta level shit. The seventh and last regular level is Pianta Village. I think it might be the most impressive looking level in the game. Some missions take place during the daytime like in the other levels, but it also has a few nighttime levels too, and the colors here were handled really well. I love how the mushrooms can really pop out at night. It's almost like a blacklight effect. It's pretty cool. The main goop you see in the majority of the missions is fire base, with the first mission needing you to spray down these baby chain chomps, and then toss them in a pool of water. There's also a mission where you have to spray down this huge chain chomp and drag it all the way back to a hot tub. This mission can be a bit time consuming, but there's also a pretty infamous glitch that can occur where if you angle it wrong and don't let go of the chain chomp, then you can get clipped inside of it and won't be able to get the shine sprite. This actually happened to me while recording, but I did manage to clip out the chain chomp's mouth, so I didn't throw the mission and still got the shine. The one mission that has the most fire goop in it is mission 3, the Goopy Inferno, which is easily one of the craziest missions in the entire game. This one starts out with Shadow Mario snatching Flood away and he puts Flood on a platform that's right in the middle of the inferno. I'm pretty sure you're meant to travel underneath the level, and then go through this little maze where you have to find the correct pathway to reach Flood, but that's not what I did. I just went climb this really tall tree, and then I spin jump to the platform that had Flood. I almost fumbled it too. That would have been game over too, because the moment Mario touches the fiery goop, he can't recover from it and it'll just drain his health really quickly. So yeah, this mission is basically one big game of the floor is lava. I like the concept, but the execution like a lot of other things in this game, really wasn't too fun. Also, when you retrieve Flood, you don't need to go clean the fiery goop. You can just hop on top of the golden mushroom, clean up the Pianta and talk to him, then he'll give you the Shine Sprite. Though there are three blue coins that are exclusive to this mission, so maybe be sure to get those first before leaving. Another one of the crazier Shine Sprites involves traveling up this really big tree in the village, and I kid you not, spraying the fucking sun. Yes, you can collect the Shine Sprite from the actual sun, and even find Funnier, at nighttime, if you spray into the moon, it can give you a blue coin. While this easter egg may seem impossible to figure out, you can actually talk to one of the Piantas and they'll even give you a hint about it, so it isn't as cryptic as it seems. Oh yeah, Piantissimo appears in this level, in his third and final appearance in the game, and effectively the whole franchise. Like I said, he's a basic side character and wouldn't really appear again after Sunshine. Though, during the game's regular ending, you see an image of Piantissimo finding Bowser Jr.'s paintbrush. I guess it was just for an ending gag because we never really got a follow-up to this ever. But Piantissimo probably isn't the mission you want to hear me talk about. The worst mission in Pianta Village, and probably the worst one in the entire game, is Mission 5, Secret of the Village Underside. First, you gotta go grab Yoshi and then use him the platform underneath the level. Since the secret course is being blocked off by that weird magma substance, that's the easy part of the mission. Upon entering the secret course, we immediately see the main problem. You have to ask multiple Piantas here no 
known as Chucksters, to throw Mario in the air and hopefully towards the other platforms that are nearby. So, if you don't have precise aim with these guys, then you are going to die, die, die! I did manage to get past this mission with just a few tries, but that only comes from mastering it after a few years. I can't imagine how difficult this mission must be for newcomers, or being real, people who just suck at platformers. But I think the main issue with this mission, and why I think it's objectively the worst one in the game, is because unlike, say, the watermelon mission in Galato Beach, you have to finish the Chuckster mission in order to beat the game. Because it's mission 5, and you don't chase Shadow Mario until mission 7. This was such a stupid design choice. My best advice is just be patient and take your time lining up your jumps correctly. It's not like you're on a time limit or some shit. That's for the red coin mission, and yes, you have to come back here to do this. At the very least, you do have Flood, so you can use Flood to hover to nearby platforms, you know, without needing to use the Chucksters all the time. Pianta Village is the last of what I consider the normal levels in the game, being ones with 11 Shine Sprites and 30 Blue Coins, but there actually is one final level in the game, and it's the final area, Corona Mountain. What an unfortunate name. It's just a straight hallway filled with lava, which you'll first have to traverse over using multiple platforms. These platforms can have both spikes, which can almost instantly kill Mario if you land on them, and there's platforms with fire on them that you can spray down using Flood's Hover, which I always thought was pretty cool. The platforming area is definitely the easiest part, but the worst part of Corona Mountain is the stupid fucking boat. You have to aim and spray Flood to help move to a certain direction, but the way the boat controls and its physics are fucking terrible. It can be pretty difficult to tell which angle is going to turn you the right way, because the wrong spraying can really nudge the boat in a direction you didn't want to go, which is super irritating. This really wouldn't be so bad, but another big problem is that if you so much as slightly tap any of the walls, the boat will instantly sink. This boat sucks and it's so annoying for no reason. I know it's the last level in the game, so a challenge is expected, but this is too much. It's just bad. The main upside here is that there's only one shine sprite and just 10 blue coins instead of the regular 30, which would have been even more hell to deal with. That's not to say the blue coins are any easier. The first one can be easily grabbed during the platforming section, but the other nine are in the annoying boat area. So you'll either have to carefully maneuver the boat to get the coins, or just die several several times until you get the rest of them. This really sucks. The last part of Corona Mountain has you using the rocket nozzle to jet Mario in the air on these clouds. Pretty simple. Though a quick fun fact about Corona Mountain, the skybox reveals it takes place in a secret course with a train track backdrop, but you don't get to see it in the actual game. Anyways, jetting Mario to the top will lead to the final boss fight with Bowser, which is where the one shine sprite can be obtained. For a final fight, it's kind of average. Bowser just sits in his bathtub while breathing fire, while Bowser Jr. is also sending rockets at you. The goal here isn't really to fight Bowser. You just gotta run to these platforms, jet Mario in the air, and then ground pound on the floor to break these sections off. You do this five times, and that's it. That's the fight. I mean, I guess Flood is apparently losing power in this fight, but it doesn't really affect that much here. It's mildly difficult, especially if you're not sure what to do, but the fight itself can actually be over in less than one minute. Minute. I think one of the biggest downsides about this fight being so short is that you barely get a chance to hear the music. I wasn't too crazy about the boss music at first, but then I went and listened to the full song on its own, and it's actually really good. The piano sections especially caught me off guard because you never really get a good chance to hear them during the fight. It sounds great! I would highly recommend listening to the full song if you guys haven't. I would even go as far to say it's one of the best music tracks in the game, and a pretty underrated piece of final boss music. I'll also say, the slowdown is atrocious during this fight. It's definitely the worst I've seen in the entire game. Like, imagine trying to play this boss fight in 60 FPS on original hardware. It's gotta look like a PowerPoint presentation. Again, it's an average boss fight, pretty underwhelming for a final boss, and definitely not the best one in the game. But it's also far from being the worst too.
When it comes to the other shine sprites, there's 40 shine sprites in the hub area, but 24 of them can be gathered from blue coins, leaving 16 to collect from either secret courses or finding them in hidden areas. For some examples, the game has its own slide course, and there's a course where you can use the jet nozzle to boost on several platforms. Those can be easy and kind of basic challenges, but when it comes to some of the more difficult shines to get, well, there's the infamous Pachinko Red Coin Machine. In concept, it's a pretty outlandish minigame and it probably could have been okay if Mario's hit detection wasn't so screwed up. For some reason, when Mario gets launched from the bounce pad, his momentum gets carried with him even after he lands on his feet. So more often or not, you'll find yourself landing on a thin platform and will probably try to hop to a nearby red coin, only for Mario to launch himself even further away and potentially make you lose a life. Just like with the Watermelon and Chuckster missions, I somehow lucked out and didn't get stuck in the Pachinko machine for too long, but that doesn't negate the fact that this is easily one of the most irritating Shine Sprites to collect in the game. The second most irritating Shine Sprite in the hub area isn't necessarily annoying because of the mission itself, but more just reaching it in general. It's locked behind a warp pipe that's on an island that's far away from Delfino Plaza, and it's also covered in that weird magma substance that only Yoshi can get rid of. And since Yoshi's aquaphobic in this game, you gotta get Yoshi to the island by traveling on these really slow moving boats, which can be really tedious. You even have to remember to keep Yoshi's stomach full, otherwise he won't make it all the way. And yes, I know there's a way to clip Yoshi into the ocean and just walk to the island, but not everyone knows how to do that, including me, so shut up. When it comes to the actual mission inside the pipe, you have to collect red coins while traveling on a lily pad, which is floating in this poisonous lake that can instantly kill Mario. This could be a pretty time consuming mission, but you really just gotta be patient and tread care Carefully. Plus, if you screw up and miss a red coin, the lily pad does respawn at the start, so you can, albeit, walk very slowly back to the beginning and try again, unless you really want to risk using shortcuts with Flood. Also, at the start of the level, there are these green pipes. They don't really do anything, but I'm bringing them up because it's probably the only green warp pipes we see in the game, since all the main ones you hop in have been red. Though, in some earlier screenshots, it showed that the warp pipes were originally going to be green like normal. I wonder why they changed it. Okay, look, I'm sure everyone watching has seen some Call Me Johnny's review, so you're probably fully aware of where this review is about to go next, but you watched this far into the review so you can't back out now. But for anyone who somehow doesn't know, what exactly do you get after you go through the hell of collecting every Shine Sprite in the game? Do you unlock a new character? Is there a bonus level? Is there anything else, like an alternate ending even? Well, after you beat the Bowser fight with all 120 Shine Sprites, wait until after the credits and you'll get that's it. That's Mario Sunshine's 100% award. That's just a flat JPEG with the character models on it! Miyamoto betrayed us! Now, look. I get the frustration, the anger, the disappointment, and also how the text have a relaxing vacation can be a real slap in the face if you maybe, oh, I don't know, spent an entire summer during your childhood collecting every shine sprite, only to get this? I never personally went through that, but I know several people who did, so I see where the hate for this stupid postcard comes from. It's just lame, and it's so clearly another rushed aspect of the game. They obviously couldn't put together a proper reward in time, so they just slapped this flat JPEG together and called it a day. What a damn shame. But when compared to seeing Yoshi and getting the pointless star jump in 64, was any of that really better than Sunshine's postcard? Yes, fuck you. I 100%ed Sunshine twice, and both times were riddled with issues and annoying moments. The second time I did it was for this review, you're welcome, but the first time I did it was in the 3D All-Stars port in 2020. I don't know why, I just felt like doing it then, but once I got that freaking postcard, I screen capped it, printed it out, and framed it. Mainly because I'm insane, look at the length of the video. But also, I earned that goddamn postcard and I deserve to display it somewhere. Also, why is it so tiny in this port? Like they didn't bother zooming in or upscaling it in any way? God, this port sucks. So that's the only 120 Shine Sprite reward. But I will say, there is one simple thing from this game that I actually originally thought was part of the 100% completion reward, but it turns out it actually isn't and can be accessed pretty early on. There's a Pianta in Delfino Plaza and a few of the levels that's also a sunglasses vendor. When you get 30 shine sprites and go talk to this guy, he'll give Mario these neat sunglasses to wear, and they just tint the screen slightly. 
it's uh it's an option however after you beat the main game you can go talk to the sunglasses vendor and not only will he give you the glasses but he also gives you this really cool shine sprite shirt to wear it's purely cosmetic but i really like the way it looks unfortunately i think the game programmed this little extra thing kind of stupid you can only put this outfit on when you find the sunglasses vendor but he doesn't appear in every level with the two ones he can't be found in being serena beach and noki bay god damn it that's literally mine and gabe's favorite levels sunshine hates us i personally wish they handled this where as long as you just speak to him in delfino plaza you should have just kept the cosmetic on permanently or maybe let you have the option to talk to the vendor again and he'll remove it i think that would have been a fair compromise along with just letting the character have this one specific but easy place you can go to to put on the outfit and to my delight an update for mario odyssey would later add the sunglasses and the shine sprite jacket as an unlockable outfit which i love the main reason i'm bringing up this outfit apart from the fact that it's the only real piece of extra content you can find in the game is that I personally think this should have been part of the 100% completion award. I know some of you might be thinking, really Cooper? Fucking sunglasses and a fancy jacket? Would that have really made the reward better? No, but it would have been something. It also still would have been better than just receiving this. But yeah, there's not really much else for Sunshine in terms of extra content. Unless you have action replay. Using a code, you can boot up this cool test level. There isn't really much here, but I just really like when games during this era had these cool test areas you can load into. It also reminds me of SA2's test level, which was also neat. I guess in terms of cut content, probably the biggest feature that fans managed to find in the game's code was apparently a scrapped multiplayer mode. Yeah, using an action replay code, you can make this multiplayer camera be loaded. If you load the game like normal, the camera's just gonna be stuck in place behind Mario, so you can't move it at all. However, when you go to an area that has a Shadow Mario chase in it, you'll notice that the camera's actually focusing on both Mario and Shadow Mario. Almost as if Shadow Mario is player 2. And some fans have actually made a mod for the game that lets the second player control Shadow Mario. But it's still pretty neat to see that a multiplayer mode was attempted, and it seems to function kind of similar to what the scrapped multiplayer mode was going to be like in Mario 64. But I do wonder if this mode was scrapped either because they couldn't figure out how to get the camera system to work, or maybe it was cut for time constraints. If they kept it in, Nintendo really could have won up the LEGO games by like 3 years since those games multiplayer mechanics essentially did what Mario 64 and and Sunshine tried to do first. Honestly, there's a bunch of fun action replay codes you can check out. There's one for the classic moon jump, which is always fun. And someone even made a code to run the game in widescreen. Straight up, you can play the game in 16x9 by using an action replay code. That's crazy. And now I think we know where 3D All-Stars got this feature from. And that's all of the original Mario Sunshine that I have to discuss. This game is incredibly unique for a Mario game, and it has a lot of charm. But it can be very rough around the edges in a lot of areas. Especially if you're going after all the shine sprites. I love the art style, the music, Noki Bay, Flood, and some of the secret courses are okay. But this is personally one of my least favorite entries in the series. But I would still recommend this game for any Mario fan that hasn't played it yet. Which I would imagine consists of a lot more fans compared to the other 3D games. Games. Super Mario Sunshine went on to sell 5.5 million copies by summer 2006, which in comparison to Mario 64's 11 million, that's pretty bad. According to Iwata, while Sunshine's sale figures were strong, the game still greatly underperformed in the eyes of the company. But I don't entirely blame these figures on Sunshine since the GameCube itself was also underselling. Hell, Melee was the best selling game on the system, and even that only managed to sell 7 million. So yeah, Mario Sunshine, despite being loved by a lot of Mario fans out there was a pretty big failure to Nintendo. But that wouldn't mean future games wouldn't pay tribute to it. I brought up earlier how Delfino Plaza was brought back as a level for Smash Brothers, and there's also Peach Beach in Mario Kart Double Dash, which would also be brought back for Mario Kart Wii. Speaking of Mario Kart Wii, the fan favorite Coconut Mall contains several references to Mario Sunshine, especially since you can see both the Piantas and Nokis in the background, and Coconut Mall would even be brought back for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe's DLC. Not to mention, Mario Mario Kart 8 even had its own Sunshine inspired course, the Sunshine Airport, which was pretty cute. Oh yeah, Delfino Plaza was also made into a map for the Wii U edition of Minecraft. Can't forget to mention that. But for those of you who want to go out and play Mario Sunshine for yourself on either your GameCube or backwards compatible Wii, copies of this game can be a little pricey, somewhere around $30 to $40. And maybe even higher if you're looking for a copy that's complete in the box. Still cheaper than Melee. But in terms of other official ways to play Super Mario Sunshine, well, you're fucked.
Mario Sunshine was only ever ported once, which was back in 2020 on that oh-so-beloved collection for Nintendo Switch, which I've been bitching about over and over again. Super Mario 3D All-Stars. I've complained about this collection a lot in previous videos, but to get the more obvious complaints out the way, it was a limited release that was launched at $60, and the ports on it felt a little half-assed and not as good as they should have been. Focusing on Super Mario Sunshine, the game is now playing in widescreen, and and the full game soundtrack was officially released on this collection for the first time. That's it. Yes, that's literally all they did with this port. It's the exact same game, but now it's in widescreen HD. While I did own and beat the game on GameCube for years, the 3D All-Stars port was the first time I ever really dedicated a good amount of time to the game, probably because it was a brand new way to play the game at the time. Plus, this was the first time I got every Shine Sprite, which was hell, but I'm sure you're sick of hearing me talk about that. Also, again, why were the JPEGs upscaled? Why did they just leave them at their original resolution? It looks so shitty like this. When it comes to other things that got upgraded, quote unquote, they just took the original cutscenes and AI upscaled them. As a result, they look muddy as hell. I'm honestly a little shocked by how terrible they look. There's no way Iwata would've let the shit slide if he was still alive. One weird thing is that even though the letterbox cutscenes were upscaled, they still have black bars on the top and bottom. That's a little confusing, why not just fill the entire frame? Speaking of which, the opening cutscene and the cutscene with PD Piranha, which were the only ones in 4x3 in the original game, were cropped and I hate that so much. What the hell is this shit, Nintendo? The game does look terrific in widescreen, but there's one glaring issue with this port and it's kind of unacceptable. Just like the other games on the collection, Sunshine's being emulated, which is really confusing on its own, but for some reason, 3D All-Star still has Sunshine running at 30 frames, when they easily could have got it running at 60. I know it's not Dolphin, but why the hell didn't they at least try to boost the frame rate here? Another weird thing is that they didn't launch the collection with GameCube controller support. They would eventually patch the game later to include it, which is good, I guess. Also, when the port first came out, it had that error where if you use the jet nozzle underwater, you can see the filter wasn't cut off properly on the left and right sides of the screen. This was patched out too, but I actually noticed the original game does this too if you run the game in 16x9 using Action Replay, and I think that kind of makes 3D All-Stars look worse. It's almost like they had some random intern just mod the game to run well enough in HD, and then called it a day. Overall, the 3D All-Stars version of Sunshine is fine enough, and it's also the only other option people have if they can't play the game on GameCube or Wii. Personally, like the other two games on this port, I just wish more effort was actually put into remastering Sunshine. Not to mention, with 3D All-Stars being a limited release, that meant scalpers online were selling the collection at higher prices because of course they can. I'd recommend just tracking down the game at stores like Walmart or Target, since you'll hopefully just come across a standard $50 to $60 copy, and not have to deal with the nightmare of eBay. Personally, I wish they would just re-release Sunshine on its own, but maybe actually port the game itself with quality of life improvements, like a frame rate boost and actual remastered cutscenes, before 2020, I never thought in a million years that Sunshine was ever going to get a port. But going off the one we did get, it honestly deserved better than this. So that's the official way you can play Nintendo Super Mario Sunshine in HD. But fuck them. Let's talk about the unofficial way. Super Mario Sunburn, a fan-made mod created by Eclipse Team, Epic Wade, and Joshua MK02. It was initially released in 2020, before 3D All-Stars was even announced, and it's a pretty fantastic effort. Aside from obvious updates like widescreen and even 60 frames a second with no slowdown on the emulator, the game also includes its own quality of life improvements, like reviving both the long jump and backflip, auto-saving on blue coins instead of pausing the game and prompting you to save, it even incorporates the Banjo-Kazooie slash Mario Odyssey strategy, where if you collect the Shine Sprite, it doesn't kick you out the level. It lets you stay so you can go after a different one. There's way more info on the Game Banana page, so you can go look into it there if you want. The game even has an actual completion award now, but but I think I'll keep that a secret. I'd probably say this is easily the definitive edition of Super Mario Sunshine, at least in terms of gameplay, most definitely. Controlling Sunshine Mario with the long jump is pretty surreal, but honestly excellent. Long jumping and immediately using the hover nozzle while it carries your momentum is awesome. You see, Sunshine fans, aka long jump deniers, this is what you guys were missing out on. As much as I love this mod, it's not perfect, far from it. The frame rate boost is incredible, but I'd only recommend 
recommend using it on emulator, since running the game on Wii and Wii U in 60 frames can cause some really bad slowdown. Also, you will still have to pause and occasionally reset the level area, mainly to access specific shine sprites, which can still be a bit clunky. At this moment in time, Mario Sunburn is at version 1.9, and I'm sure they're still working on it nowadays. But the only real game-breaking issue I found was when I got to Serena Beach, I went to the casino area only to discover one of the slot machines is literally broken and won't move, no matter how many times I spray it. I'm not sure how common this glitch is, but it literally locked me out of collecting a few shine sprites. Hopefully they'll patch this in a future update. The only unfixable thing I noticed was that the cutscenes can't be recropped or upscaled for the widescreen resolution. You can skip the cutscenes though, so it's not a huge deal. Overall, I think this mod did a really solid job improving the game. Not every single issue with Sunshine is necessarily fixed, but it's still a really fun alternate way to play the game, and I'd highly recommend it to any Sunshine fan out there who hasn't played it yet. It's kind of crazy when you realize that both Sunburn and that PC port of 64 were both in circulation before 3D All-Stars was even announced, so fans were already ahead of the curve when it came to making and playing better versions of both these games, which you know Nintendo was never gonna give us. How sad. And if some of you were looking for more Mario Sunshine action, the same team behind Sunshine are also making another mod, with new levels, music, and mechanics called Super Mario Eclipse. At the time of this review, the full thing isn't out yet, but there is a demo you can go play if you want to try it out. It looks pretty fun so far. I'm not sure how to end this review. I hate Nintendo, and I miss Iwata every day. I'm not sure if there's any nuance or worthwhile thing I could say to close out the video, but while Super Mario Sunshine may not be one of my favorite Mario games, and is also a Mario game I have zero nostalgic attachment to, I will praise it for trying to be different. Later on, at least until Odyssey, future Mario games are gonna just kind of play it safe. They're still well-crafted titles with a lot of effort put into them, but they'll just become less experimental or unique, especially during the Wii slash Wii U era. That's something I'll always give the Sunshine. Despite its faults, it wasn't just trying to be Mario 64 2 or just another run-of-the-mills Mario game. It was Mario Sunshine. And you know what? For some people, that's just enough. With that said, I have a much larger attachment to the Wii era for Mario, so I guess I'll see how those reviews turn out compared to this one and 64. Damn, the Galaxy reviews are gonna go crazy. But I'm glad I gave Sunshine a go. Despite not growing up with it, there was still a lot about it and the era of gaming that it came from which gave me a lot to talk about, and I appreciate that. So I guess until next time, go check out Super Mario Sunshine or Mario Sunburn if any of you were interested. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all in the next review. Take care and good night.